Well, hello and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I'm pleased to introduce you to Chandler Bolt, the author of Published, The Proven Path from Blank Page to 10,000 Copies Sold. I'm intrigued already. As a seven-time best-selling author and CEO of Self Publishing School and SelfPublishing.com, Chandler knows exactly how instrumental writing books can be in sharing your message and even growing and scaling your business. His message is that you can't wait for the perfect time in life to get writing. The perfect time to get writing is right now. So uh, welcome to Uncorking a Story, Chandler. Mike, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Nice to have you. So I'm going to ask you the same question I ask everybody. Um, it, it sometimes throws people off guard, but you can pick uh, where you want to start. Uh, so the question is, where does your story begin? Woo! The story begins, and I think in a lot of places, uh, I think it begins with the major part of the story if you if we're starting the story with you know we're jumping straight into the action there's conflict there's character development um i would say it's, it'd be dropping out of school okay and um, i dropped out of college um because i realized i was learning how to run a business from professors who have never ran businesses <laughs> and that didn't make <laughs> sense um so i said all right i gotta drop out i want to start this business and and the process of dropping out wrote and published a couple of books those books started doing decently well. People started asking, hey, how are you doing this? And then that ultimately led to the birth of self-publishing school. And then, and then down the road, the creation of this book uh, to teach it in both book format and then um, through, through the school and that sort of thing. So that's kind of the, the maybe the opening chapter would be the uh, <laughs> college dropout and C-level English student with ADHD starts writing books. <laughs> well, let's, let's rewind a bit because I, I, I have to ask, um, wh where were you going to college at the time? Yeah, um, so I did not drop out of Harvard, <laughs> which in my mind, I'm thinking, hey, you know, Zuckerberg dropped out, Bill Gates. So I dropped out of College of Charleston <laughs> okay. um, uh, in South Carolina. So that's where I went. All right. So and, and you were studying, sounds like you were studying English at the College of Charleston? No, actually, I was studying entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship, management, okay. entrepreneurship. And, and, and so I never imagined that I would write books and I didn't like writing and I wasn't good at it. Um, and, and but I'm kind of an entrepreneur through and through, but didn't realize, OK, the books are this really cool mechanism to change the lives of readers and change the lives of authors. Right. And that's why I, I started realizing it by writing those two books. But then when I dropped out, my big thing was all right, I need to operate like I'm still in school learning, um, even though I'm not. And so I need to learn like I'm still in school because I'm going to miss out on these two years. And so I just turned to books yeah. instead of curriculum, instead of going to class. Right. And so that's where, you know, I always say it's like a book is like a $15 mentor. The smartest, most successful people on the planet <laughs> have written books and all you got to do is pay 15 bucks and, and, and spend a few hours to read them. And so that's where I kind of started shifting to that as a learner um, of, okay, I'm going to read a book a week and have been for years. And that's going to be the way that I keep learning like I'm still in school. So you were, you're a couple of years into your, uh, your, your tenure. So sophomore year, you decide and the sophomore year, you decide, Hey, this is, this is not for me. What, what was the, the family reaction to this decision? Were? <laughs> oh man, it was, uh, yeah. I mean, there was a lot of mixed reactions. Um, I think my family, my initial family, so my parents, um, they were supportive. They were, ch they challenged me but then they were supportive. So their big thing is we wanna make sure that you're not making a rash decision and just you're pissed. You don't like your teacher, you don't wh whatever else. And you're just like, screw this, I'm dropping out. So that was their thing. And so, but once I, once I talked through my logic with them and I had, you know, went to a bunch of mentors about it and that sort of thing. And they said, each person kept saying like Chandler, for almost everyone, I would not recommend this. For you, I think this makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, there so was that enough of that, that they were supportive. Once they understood my reasoning and then there was the extended, not so much fit, like, it's like just people I knew all growing up, just coming out of the woodworks, like Chandler, you're making a big mistake. I think you need to <laughs> rethink this, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So uh, you were studying entrepreneurship. Were, were you always an entrepreneur? I mean, like going back to like your first jobs and stuff like that, like what were you, uh, yeah. what, what was kind of keeping you busy? How were you earning some, some cash in, in your younger days? Yeah, I think uh, entrepreneur through and through. I mean, I love it. I think it's one of the best ways that you can make a difference um, to build wealth and to make a difference. You get to change the lives of your employees, your customers, and create a profit that then you, you can have offshoots of that too through nonprofits and stuff. So 
Um, so yeah, I mean, growing up is I, uh, first business was, uh, I did a, uh, ran a canteen at my school. Um, we made $8,000 profit in two and a half months selling snacks at lunch. So what, um, kind of, what kind of things were you selling at the school? Yeah, it was. Uh, so we had this, I, I was, I'm very fortunate. We had an entrepreneurship class. Mm -hmm. um, and for one semester, you get to run the business. And so that was just like a big ripple effect for me. Because in the first semester, you create a business plan. Um, and so all these people were creating these crazy business plans. I felt like the lamest guy in the room because I created a business plan for like this pressure washing and landscaping and lawn care business, which that actually ended up being the first business I ran. I was one of the only people that actually did it. But at the time I felt like it was this, okay, I'm lame. Like, this is not a cool idea. But then second semester of that class, they said, we, we're going to run a business as a class and um, you get to pick what the business is and then we'll do it. And so we picked a canteen. And um, so we were selling all like we were selling, you know, drinks, snacks, pizza, all this stuff. And um, during lunch. And so that was kind of a big light bulb moment for me where, we made eight grand in profit in that two and a half months. And they voted me president and this other guy, vice president. And so it was like every week we would go in his Prius to Sam's and we're just like buying with a stack of ones because that's what we got paid in, you know, people are buying stuff and just, we're just buying everything. Um, but then we're restocking in the mornings, like all this stuff. But at the end of that whole experience, I got 2000 bucks to like, I got, I got that paid, paid that. And that was just, I mean, at that age and at that time, it's just like 2000 bucks. It's crazy. I felt like I got paid to go to school. Yeah. And now the truth is I worked a lot on this business outside of school, but I felt, and so that was where I realized, oh, hold up. And then that, and then rolling into the landscaping lawn care business. And then ultimately in college, I ran a, a painting business through student painters, but like all those, they just started to shift the way, you know, I was working a maintenance job before that before my pressure washing and painting business. And I just remember that light bulb moment where I got paid like 400 bucks in a day to pressure wash someone's house. And I realized I was like, oh, that's an iPod. <laughs> right. And I would have had to work for weeks and weeks and weeks at my minimum wage, you know, maintenance job to, to buy an iPod. But that's now an iPod is a day's worth of work running my own business. Yeah. So it sounds kind of funny, but, but just your mental association with things totally shifting. And then it's kind of one of those things where once you see it, you can't unsee it. Yeah. I was curious when you were talking about $8,000 profit at the, the school canteen, if, if you also learned how to, to keep a second set of books and skim from the top. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, no, uh, that have been frowned help. upon in an academic environment. But yeah, and and that's not really my that's not my uh, my mo anyway. But uh, basically, how they did it is uh, they it was on units of hours worked, and so it was like I'm going to say the me and the president worked the most, and we got yep. two thousand apiece, and then the rest of the class split the four thousand. So everyone made everyone in the class made money. Everyone was excited. I think the next year they may have shut it down because um, they're like, hey, you guys are taking money from like the school, like from the, the cafeteria, like people are buying your stuff. <laughs> right. Too much. But look, it's a lesson in competition, though. I mean, yeah. hey, it's, it's Chandler versus, yeah. the, versus the lunch ladies, you know? Yeah. Hey, 48 Laws of Power. What is it? Don't outshine the master. Right. And in, in that instance, we did. And, and I guess it got shut down. But yeah. great learning experience. Well, speaking of learning experiences, talk to me about the first book you wrote after sort of leaving your leaving school and kind of what you learned about writing and publishing. I mean, kind of, you know, you're, you're mentioning that you weren't a great student, you know, a C yeah. student. Um, you know, what did you learn about yourself during that process? What did you learn about sort of the writing business during that process? Yeah, first book I wrote um, called The Productive Person. Um, it was all about productivity for entrepreneurs. And so kind of as I was dropping out of school, um, I, had, I, um, I was in stu doing student painters right before that. And that's basically for those who aren't familiar, it's kind of like an internship meets franchise. They teach you how to run a business by running a house painting business, exterior house painting business. And so I, my first year of that company, I was number one in the whole country, number one in the company. And then I came back the next year and trained some guys to run their businesses. And basically from that, I was just getting a lot of questions from people who want to start businesses. 
And I, I realized there were so many people around me who are entrepreneurs, but couldn't figure out how to go from entrepreneur to entrepreneur. And so me and uh, my manager at the time said, hey, let's just like put together a little guide on like productivity and stuff for entrepreneurs and lessons we've learned. So it started out as kind of a, hey, this is going to be a 20 page PDF. And it evolved into a full book. And at some point we said, hold up, we should just, we should make this an ebook and publish on Amazon and like see how it goes. And we did that. Um, and it just started taking off. And so that's where, the, you know, that was kind of where, as I was dropping out, that happened. Um, and then I pretty quickly thereafter did another book with my brother. Um, uh, and he, he's probably some pretty big rock and roll band. And so it was kind of like, those were the 15 things that we learned growing up from our parents that we thought everyone learned, but then you get out in the real world and you realize like, oh, no one, no one knows this. And so it was his perspective as a musician, mine as a business guy on these same 15 things. So those, those were kind of, that's the story behind the story of like those first two books. And then it really, I think, started catching on and ultimately led to, to creating self-publishing school. Yeah. Wow. So tell me a little bit more about the self-publishing school and kind of what your mission is with it and how you're helping uh, people who want to get published. Yeah, so we self-publishing school, we're an online education company. We help people write and publish books um, that grow their impact, their income, and their business if they have one. Uh, and so we look at it, we believe that books change lives, right? Like we talked about books change lives of readers, they change the lives of authors. And so it's our goal to help facilitate that. Um, we're one of the fastest growing companies in the US. We've published about 6,000 books in the last seven years. Um, so publish. Wow. Typically a couple books a day um, and, uh, and, you know, we've grown really quickly and our goal is to publish a hundred thousand books by 2035. So made a lot of progress, got a long way to go. Um, and uh, yeah, we love books <laughs> and we love helping people publish books. So do you have your own imprint for this or, um, you know, is it, are you set up as a publishing company? Yeah, great question. Um, we don't have our, imp uh, our own imprint currently. We've always been a self-publishing company through and through. So we also own selfpublishing.com um, and a bunch, kind of a bunch of other sites in the space. We've considered it open up like kind of a hybrid publishing arm or an imprint or that sort of thing. We haven't done it yet. Um, so as of now, it's everyone, well, we have some students that traditionally publish, but most students self-publish um, and they're, they're, they get to keep all the royalties and it's not under an imprint or anything like that. Got it. Got it. So your, your, your business model is kind of just on the coaching side of things versus on sort of the publishing side of things. Yeah. Yeah. It's on, really on the education side. We've got the curriculum, we've got coaching, and then now we've just rolled out as here recently, a bunch of services. So now we'll, we'll format people's books. We'll create a book cover for them. We'll choose their keywords and categories. We'll upload to, and like, we just realized that, you know, coaching that many people through the process over the years, it's like they get close to the finish line. It's like, all right, go to this person, like find someone here to format, find someone here to book code. Okay, now upload. Okay, how do you do that? Okay, Ingram Spark, like people just, I mean, a bajillion question. We realize yeah. we're answering so many questions and, and so much training material on this stuff. And really what people kept asking for was, can I just pay you? Like, I don't want to work with 15 different people in this thing. Can I just pay you guys to do it? So we finally rolled that out and we're starting to scale up kind of the services arm of the company as well. Just yeah. To, help people in that part, part of the process. It, that's smart because, you know, you, you mentioned kind of getting them to like the five yard line, right? So you're, yeah, you're totally. getting them to like all their contents there. Although the words have been written, uh, it's been edited, but then it's okay. Well, how do I get it up to Amazon? And Amazon yeah. is one source of distribution. Yep. Now I got to go to Ingram spark. If I want yep. you know wider distribution and bookstores, and then there's, you know, other e publishers like Smashwords or whoever, you know, to help you get um, outside of Amazon for, for digital distribution. So there, there is a, there are a lot of moving pieces and I've, I've yeah. coached people through that too. And it's not, uh, you know, I, I've done it for years. And so I have this all in my head, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is, it, it can be overwhelming. Um, oh my gosh. Yes. Absolutely overwhelming for, sure. for people. And the landscaping is totally ch always changing, right? Yeah. Like smash words just merge with draft digital. And like, right. this is like, there's all these things that are constantly changing. So yeah. then you're having to update all your tutorials and all that. So we just said, Hey, let's just start doing this for people. And it's going to serve them at a higher level. And help them be more successful with their books. Yeah. So let's talk about the, uh, the sort of the target audience that you're going after. Um, it, it sounds like it could be professionals um, who are looking to use a book to leverage, um, kind of grow their own customer base. Although I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, who, who is the, who's the ideal target for yeah, you? Yeah, that's a big bucket. There's probably three main avatars. There's Susie, 
Um, Susie wants to write a book to make an impact. Um, often 45 to 65 plus year old female kind of second, second phase of life. Um, and hey, I've got all these life experiences that I want to crystallize into a book and, I want, and this book is going to help people. Um, th th then you have Jeff, who's maybe a younger, like 35 to 50 year old business owner, that young professional, that sort of thing, um, and wants to write a book to grow their business. And then you have third bucket would probably be Riley, um, who Riley um, wants to write great fiction. Um, that entertains people, or maybe even kind of, we have a children's book school and we have a fundamentals of fiction and story arm. And so that's kind of Riley and uh, there's, there's probably another avatar of like educators who want to write children's books. Yeah. <laughs> um, but th those are kind of the main pockets for sure. Got it. So you got some, you got a couple of different personas there, a couple of different market segments that you're, mm -hmm. you're kind of going after. And, you know, I think, you know, as you get into fiction, it gets really interesting because then there are so many different subgenres within oh my fiction gosh, that yes. you could probably have a lot of, you know, growth and, and fun with trying to appeal to those. So how do you, how are you finding your customers? I mean, how are just kind of getting into the business side of things, you know, yeah. how are you, how are you attracting um, the authors um, and I guess students to, to come on board? Yeah, a few ways. Um, I think one of the ways is um, one of the top ways is just creating great content. Um, so whether that's our podcast, whether that's the blog, whether that's selfpublishing.com, self-publishing school blog, um, or the newest book, um, that's been a big, um, big source of revenue already. Um, people check out published, they read it, they book a call with my team, sign up. Um, for the school. So those, that, those are, that's the main way. And really what we're reinvesting a lot more into is content. We do some paid acquisitions like Facebook, YouTube, all that stuff. And then um, some partnerships like strategic partnerships, that sort of thing. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Those are, those are probably the main ones. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so let's talk about the new book. Um, so the book is uh, published, The Proven Path from Blank Page, 10,000 copies. sold. hold it up again. Let me see that. Cover. Yeah. So this is really you kind of putting your money where your mouth is, right? I mean, it, it is it's you kind of kind of proving out your your business, kind of using it for that that one bucket yeah. anyway of right. of um, of you know potential uh, prospects. Yeah. Um, tell me how how did you conceive of this, and um, what was the process like putting it together? Yeah, so I don't know if people can see the video, but um, there is a first edition of published, which is this here, um, and then there's the second edition, which I just released in December. So. The first edition has been, gosh, sold and downloaded, I don't even know, hundreds of thousands of times and has brought in millions of dollars for revenue in revenue for self-publishing school over the years. And so it's done really well. It's helped a ton of people. And that was a big thing for me is I think a lot of times we'd be so focused. It sounds funny to say as someone who works with authors, but so focused on our business that we forget about the impact that our books are making. And so it, there was just this time period where it just kept coming up and where my brother was about to go on tour and his guitar tech said, hey, how's your brother doing? And he said, well, hold up. How do you know my brother? And he said, oh, well, I read his book and I published a book. And he's in that story. And then I went to Cidercade here in Austin. Somebody comes up to me. They're like, hey, are you that guy that, that wrote published? I was like, yeah. And they said, oh, this is me and my sister. We both read that book and published it. Like so many examples of that. And so then I realized, hold up. A lot of people are reading this book and publishing books just based off of this book. And I went back and read it and I said, well, this sucks. Um, <laughs> and so it's like all of our curriculum had gotten so much better and the book had stayed the same. So it was like there was six years of, or four or five, six years of learning that had happened since publishing that the first edition of published. So that's when I said, all right, I want to up level this and a lot of curriculum and content and concepts and templates and like things to make the process faster, easier. People can write a better book that sells more copies, grows their bit, like all that stuff. So that's when I said, all right. And kind of what you alluded to is, um, I, and I could be the example. Sure. So I'm, I'm like, I'm going to prove the, pro we tell people in as little as 90 days, you can do this. And so I went, I think pen to paper it was either August 31st or September 1st. Um, the second edition came out. I want to say it was December 14th. Um, so it was all told, I want to say it was like 105 days end in while running a company with 30 something employed. Like I, I was the ultimate person that could say, I don't have time to write a book. <laughs> Right. But I said, all right, this is a priority and it'll be, it's going to be one of the best things we can do to grow the business. So I got to bite the bullet and hunker down. And um, it was a, it was an intense few months, um, but we got it done. And, and now it's, it's, it's making a big impact 
for people, but then also on the business. Yeah, kind of another proof in the pudding, uh, you know, moment yeah. there is, which yeah. is, hey, you know, I'm sure people come back and come over to you and say, hey, look, I'm running a business. I don't have time to do this. So what yeah. do you say to those people? I mean, hey, I mean, you could clearly say, hey, I did it. Yes. Um, but like, what's some advice you give to somebody who wants to wants to do this? And then they put that barrier up in front of you and say, you know what? I just don't have the time. Yeah. Um, my, my big, my big thing, um, is there's never going to be a perfect time. A lot of people say maybe someday, maybe next year, and you'll never find the time to write the book. You're going to have to make the, make the time to write the book. And I talk about this. I want to say it's chapter two of the next book. I talk about, okay, you got to figure out why you're writing this book, but then maybe more importantly than that, you got to figure out why now, because you're not going to write the book until the why now is strong enough. Right? And so, so you're going to have to get started before you're ready. You got to come up with a compelling why now, um, and then set aside the time. And whether you're running a business, whether you're a busy mom, you know, whether you've got three jobs, like there's never going to be a perfect time and you're never just going to have the time. But if you make the time, I think it's one of the most rewarding things that you can do. And, and, and you, it's, that's a temporary sacrifice, right? So for me, it was 105 days. That's a temporary sacrifice. Um, where I sacrificed a lot of things, but I created an asset that will be a part of my legacy. We'll continue to make money for the long term. We'll continue to grow the business for the long time. Like it's a short term sacrifice to build a long term asset. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is going to be a you know, I, I maybe the term passive revenue stream isn't isn't you know accurate because it's not really passive. You put a lot of time into it. Yeah. But you know, it's one of those things. But that after it's out, to, it's, exactly. It's very passive. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I also want to touch on is, you know, we, we talked about kind of writing a book, the importance of writing a book, how it could help you, but there's a lot of people who write books out there and then they just don't sell. Um, yeah. So I want to talk about um, one of the biggest challenges I found anyway, is wh when I started writing novels was, you know, I, I, I could get the story down, um, I could get everything together, I could package it up, I can get it into distribution, but then it's, okay, well, how do you get it, you know, beyond friends and family to buy? Yeah. And I think this is something that, that, you know, independently published people, you know, will, will struggle with. So what's, yeah. what's your secret to promotion? Cause you mentioned, you know, selling millions of um, millions of copies or at least hundreds of thousands of copies leading to seven yeah. figures of income for the school. How do you, uh, what's, what, what tips do you give people in terms of promotion? Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a great point and a great question, Mike. I think, First and foremost, it's the mindset of you are responsible for the marketing of your book, all right? And, and as an author, it is our most important job. If you, so many authors, they'll spend so much time writing a great book. They'll market that book for one week, then they'll drop it like it's hot and move on to the next project, right? And that's just such a huge mistake. Um, I, I, and so, and good news, though, is not just independently published authors. That's traditionally published authors, too. No matter which path you choose, you are responsible. The publisher is going to say, hey, how are you going to sell this book? What's your plan? <laughs> which I think is shocking for people sometimes. They're like, hold up, what's my plan? What's your plan? <laughs> You're the publisher. Right. <laughs> but no matter what, you as the author are responsible for marketing that book. Um, you've got to learn to become friends with Sam or sales and marketing. Right. So you got to get comfortable with, with it and you don't have to like it, but you do have to learn it. Um, and there's a bunch of practical things that I can teach, but, but, but really like if, 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 if you don't have that marketing mindset for your book, nothing I teach is going to matter because you're not going to value it, prioritize it, or take the time to do it. Right. And so there's the mindset piece first, but then there's what I call the one year launch and that's committing to marketing your book for one year. So yes, there's a lot of things like creating a launch team, get as many reviews as possible, um, doing promotions during, that's the launch triangle is what I call it, is a launch team, reviews and promos or promotions. That's like how you maximize your launch. That's important, all right? But if you don't do anything after the end of that launch week, then you're gonna have a nice spike. And then uh, we, I call it, a, it's like the tale of two troubled authors. You've got failed launch Fred and successful launch Sally. Um, and Fred didn't, didn't market his book well <laughs> and didn't have a plan, just said, hey, if I build it, they will come. And they didn't come, right? Um, but then there's, there's Sally, who successful launch Sally, who she had a plan. She focused on the launch. The launch went well, but then Fred and Sally are in the same exact spot two, three weeks later, which is, hold up, my book isn't selling. 
now. <laughs> I launched successfully my book isn't selling. So how do I sell long-term? And that's where it goes into the one-year launch and in creating evergreen marketing assets that will continue to market the book long-term. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, it, it's such a, and you're right. You know, even people who go through the big publishing houses, you know, and I talk to many of them, they all say the same thing. It's like, well, you know, it's up to us to, to, you know, go on the podcasts and, and, yeah. and, you know, do all the, uh, the morning shows and all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, so I want to, I want to take a, take a break from talking about the hard stuff. I want to get to some fun questions here because I always, I always like to say that I like to uncover, you know, the stories behind the story and, and, uh, we'll, when I get to your story a little bit, but to, to get to know you a little bit more, I'd, I'd be curious to know what were some of your favorite TV shows when, uh, when you were a kid? Who man, when I was a kid, favorite TV shows were survivor. Uh, that I love, I love that. I've always like kind of secretly <laughs> wanted to be on survivor. I think a lot of people probably do. I, I would be voted off the Island immediately. <laughs> I love that <laughs> show, man. It's so fun. I probably would too. Um, but it'd be fun to at least try it. So I think that one, and then this is a way throwback, but 24 and. Oh, uh, sure. Um, oh gosh. What, Prison Break. Oh my gosh. I love that show. Prison Break. I, I never saw Prison Break. I did watch the first season of 24. Um, <laughs> I know, I know. So my daughter and I would watch it and she, you know, she has some anxiety issues. She would get so anxious as we were watching. 24. Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, and then we'd have to keep watching because, you know, it's, uh, they, yeah. they are, the, they are so good at the suspenseful ending. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So survivor, but yeah, I'd totally be voted off the Island. I would not that and like fear factor. I'd, I'd, I wouldn't even audition yeah. for fear factor. I'd just run away. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned your brother is a, a musician. Um, I'm curious to know what, what artists would we find you listening to? Um, if, if mm -hmm. I looked into your streaming files or your, you mentioned iPod before, <laughs> um, you know, who would we see, uh, kind of, uh, being played most? Oh man, I would say, uh, foster the people love them a lot. Um, and then gosh, that that's the big one. And then I got to give a shout out. My brother plays in the band called need to breathe. Um, and I mean, I'm listening to their stuff <laughs> and then depends on the time of the day. Cause I ADHD, I got to go no lyrics if I'm working right. uh, and then I can do, I can do lyrics and stuff other times. Yeah, I know none of the bands you mentioned, by the way. <laughs> none of them, you know. Uh, if you said U2 and Van Halen, I, you know, there'd be a shot. But yeah. Uh, um, how about this? Aside from uh, writing or in addition to writing, uh, what, what are some activities that make you happy? Oh, man, I love, I love to wake surf. Uh, I love playing tennis. I love live music. Obviously, my brother playing the band. I grew up going to a lot of concerts and festivals and that sort of thing. So those, those three things and snowboarding, those four, I guess, are like, those are my go-tos and my two loves are business and music. So anything that has the intersection of that is uh, I love it. So did you go to, uh, you mentioned being in Austin, were you at South by Southwest this, uh, this year? A little bit. I, I just popped into an event or two, some music yeah. stuff. Um, but I did go to Austin city limits, which is a few months. Oh ago. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. That's very cool. Yeah. My son um, works for, he goes to the university of Connecticut. And he has a job with UCTV, so their TV station. Cool. And they offered him the opportunity to go to South by Southwest. They were going to put him up, uh, give him, you know, a press pass. And um, all he had to do was like kind of cover cover the event. And I'm like, Patrick, are, are you going to take advantage of it? He's like, no, I don't think so. I'm like, why would you not do that? <laughs> oh, my God. And um, this, yeah. this is just sort of the difference between father and son, because I would like be clamoring. Oh my I didn't gosh. even know that that wasn't even an option for me yeah. when I was, you know, in college, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's such a cool thing. I've, I've, I've always wanted to go. I never went. My, my niece is in Austin. So that, that could be a good excuse to come. It's worth and, the trip. Uh, it's a great visit. city. It's growing very Yeah. Good. Yeah. It's a great city. Uh, a lot of people from LA going to, uh, to Austin now. Yes. Um, I think you just got, you just got Joe Rogan not too long ago, right? Going, uh, Joe Rogan, Elon Musk. Yeah. Uh, people from, uh, Oracle moved here. Like, yeah, a bunch. It's becoming an up and coming tech hub. Um, a lot of people from all over moving. Yeah. All right. How about this? Uh, thinking about writing now, um, how do you feel when you're staring at a blank piece of paper or a blank computer screen, you know, when you're about to write something, what kind of emotions are you experiencing looking at that blank page? Uh, I mean, I'd like, I want to beat my head into the keyboard and then throw my laptop out the window. Yeah. I mean, I think that's how most people feel. And that, that's my goal is to prevent that. Um, and, and that's just funny. You mentioned that. Cause that's why I put that in the subtitle yeah. the proven path from blank page. Cause I feel like that, that, that phrase blank page elicits an emotion 
And so that's how I felt this last go round, but it was really helpful to, uh, I teach this kind of mind map outline, right process. And so it was really helpful to have that mind map there to at least spark some ideas. Right. Now this one's going to be more of a softball for you because uh, it's kind of in your job description, but like what, what, what are some of the best pieces of advice you could give to an aspiring author? Oh man, uh, I'd, I'd give one piece of advice for an aspiring author, um, which is get started. I, there's never going to be a perfect time. You're going to have to start before you're ready. What I'd encourage you to do is as soon as this uh, podcast is over, grab a blank sheet of paper, draw a circle in the middle, write your book idea, set a timer for 15 minutes, write out everything that you can think of on that topic in 15 minutes, stories that you have, lessons that you've learned, conversations that you have, books that you've read, and you're going to discover that there's a whole lot more that you can write about than you think. And that's going to help you get jump started um, with your book. There you go. 15 minute exercise. Everyone's got 15 minutes to spare, right? Yes. Yes. Um, last up is uh, inspired by a Brad Paisley song called Letter to Me, which is um, you know, all about him writing a letter to his younger self, uh, kind of reassuring him about certain things that's going to happen in life. If you could write a letter to the younger Chandler, what are some of the things you would you know, sort of tell your younger self to, to reassure him? Yeah, it would be don't cut corners. Uh, it would be be confident in who you are uh, and what you're doing. And it would be dream and act bigger. All right. Now that's like bullet points. It's not really a letter. That's okay. Uh, no, those bullet are points the highlights. Are <laughs> those are the highlights. Yeah. We don't need pros here. Bullet points. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I know you were very generous. You've got a, a special offer to the listeners of Uncorking Your Story. Why don't you tell, uh, tell everybody about it? Yeah. So, um, so the new book published the proven path from blank page to 10,000 copies sold. Um, you can get it on Amazon highly. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably an audiobook person. You can check it out on audible, um, and, and grab a copy there. I narrate it. So highly recommend that. But if you want a free physical copy of the book for the first 50 listeners of this podcast, um, we'll give you a free copy. You don't have to pay shipping. You don't have to pay anything. Just literally just tell me where to send it. Um, so books on me, um, go to published book, like I published a book. So publishedbook.com forward slash Carlin, that's C-A-R-L-O-N. There you go. Right? They, the O always throws people off. The O yes. always throws people off. Yes. But, uh, yeah. Publishedbook.com slash Carlin. And uh, the first 50 people get a, uh, get a complimentary copy. I'm very generous. Thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Chandler, anything else you'd like to say before we part ways? Uh, I think that's it. I mean, get, get started. <laughs> if you're thinking about doing it, stop thinking about it, start doing it. Um, if you want our help at self-publishing school, grab a copy of the book or go to self-publishingschool.com forward slash apply. Um, you can book a call with our team. We're happy to chat with you about your book. Um, next steps, put together a plan, um, see how we might be able to help. Very good. Uh, Chandler, thanks so much for the time today. Mike, thank you so much.